Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for this very important discussion on the need to protect the amazing cultural and historic resources of the greater Chaco region and landscape from the encroachment of oil and gas development. Joining us on the call today in our discussion will be first U.S. Representative Deb Holland from New Mexico, Governor Brian Bayo of the Pueblo of Acoma, and Octavius Seatewa, a cultural leader with the Pueblo of Zuni. We'll start with um, brief introductory remarks by all of our panel, and then we'll go into a question and answer period for the reporters at the end. With that, um, again, welcome. And I'd like to turn this over to our first speaker, Congresswoman Deb Holland of New Mexico. Thank you so much, Paul. And thank you, um, honored to be here with all of you. And uh, thank you all so much for being a part of this important discussion today. As chair of the House Subcommittee on National Parks, Forests and Public Lands, I'm delighted to continue the discussion of how to protect the land of Chaco Canyon, as well as to honor and respect the legacy that my ancestors left to me and my Fueblo, fellow Pueblo people. Earlier this summer, the House of Representatives passed the spending bill for the Department of the Interior for the upcoming fiscal year 2021. That bill included a provision that I, along with a few other members of Congress, requested to extend the moratorium on oil and gas drilling on federal lands near the Chaco Culture National Historic Park for one more year. This bill is part of my continued commitment to protecting the ancestral homeland of indigenous people from New Mexico. Last year, I had the honor of managing the house consideration of the Chaco Cultural Nash Heritage Protection Act, which would permanently withdraw over 315,000 acres of minerals owned by the federal government from future leasing and development. I'm working hard with my colleagues in the house and Senate to ensure that the environmental concerns you mentioned are included in the bills that we are drafting, that we continue the temporary moratorium and that we work toward enactment of the permanent moratorium in addition to getting interior to release the funding Congress provided for this fiscal year for the tribally led cultural resources study of the surrounding areas. This funding should have been awarded already, but as of today, it has not. Um, I also want to mention that the cultural, uh, the Chaco Cultural, uh, Area, cultural Heritage Protection Act was a bipartisan bill that was worked on uh, by my colleagues and I on both sides of the aisle. The protection of Chaco Canyon should not be up for debate, but President Trump's energy dominance agenda has put it in danger. Elected officials need to hear from you about how special Chaco Canyon is how the area is important to our, not just our communities now, but to our future. And it's up to all of us to protect it. Um, we cannot wait, stand by and wait while damage is done that is irreparable. So I will continue this fight and, um, and on, am honored to uh, uh, work toward protecting this valuable a uh, cultural resource um, beside uh, so many people in New Mexico who value uh, it as well. Um, and now I, I am honored to turn uh, the conversation over to Governor Brian Bayo, the Pueblo of Acoma, and a very strong voice in environmental protection in New Mexico. Governor? Well, hope. It's good to be here with all of you and thank you Representative Holland for the introduction and your continued leadership. Uh, it's very, very much appreciated and valued. Um, so yes, my name is Brian Vallo and I'm the governor here at the Pueblo of Acoma. Um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to share a little bit about the, about the Pueblo of Acoma and our efforts to protect Chaco Canyon especially during uh, this ongoing public health crisis. I hope to provide some context of why Chaco Canyon is important and why it requires our collective and immediate attention and protection. Chaco Canyon or Washbashaka is one of our ancestral homelands occupied by our ancestors, um, built by our ancestors. 
and settled for a very important reason. And so it wasn't just a place that they came upon and they decided to build a place, a homeland, but it was a place predetermined at the time of emergence that those ancestors would arrive in this, on this landscape to continue a migration and to continue preparing for their continued migration to places like Agu or Akama, where they would settle um, for eternity. But leaving Chaco didn't mean that we didn't maintain connection. The connections to places like Chaco Canyon and Mesa Verde and other places within the Four Corners region of the country, and even beyond those ancestral homelands, are critical to the continuance of Acoma culture, are con critical to the continuance of Pueblo culture in New Mexico. We also have our brothers and sisters on the Hopi tribe in Arizona who have the similar connections that we do. And so we work together and are committed even in this time to ensure that the, the landscape of Chaco and the, of these other ancestral homelands are protected as someone said earlier, for future generations. Now there has been a lot of work that has gone into this effort by many tribal leaders of the past, many Native American and non-Native individuals who have committed their careers really to understanding these ancestral homelands, but to also work towards developing a strong voice on the national level and even internationally to bring these issues to the public's attention and to impact then policy within our federal system to ensure that those of us who are descendants of these places have the right and have the opportunity to engage with the federal government as it considers these places maybe not for the same reasons, but they too are engaged in a level. And, and fortunately, as um, the Congresswoman stated, there has been an appropriation of federal funding to support additional ethnographic work on behalf of the Pueblo communities, because this information is sparse. This information that's available currently is incorrect. The narrative is not ours necessarily, but the narrative developed by numerous archeologists and anthropologists, federal agencies who have created these narratives without any involvement or invitation to those of us who are descendants of these places. And so it's so critical in this time, especially with the ongoing initiatives to further develop oil and gas in this area that we create this narrative, that we produce the information that is vital, so vital to federal processes, including the National Environmental Protection Act and that process. Our record, our voice needs to be written, it needs to be documented, and needs to be utilized as source information as federal agencies and others consider development in this area. We already know that in our very recent history, the ongoing effects of fracking and oil and gas development in this region has created numerous challenges for residents who live near Chaco Canyon who live on that landscape, but it has also impacted the wildlife, the plant life, the environment within that region that is so sacred to all of us Pueblo people. 
And so we really need to make it make a strong stance on this as as Native Americans, as descendants of these places. That it is important for us to have a direct involvement moving forward on these issues. And while we appreciate the opportunity to have discussions like this and opportunities to speak with our congressional delegates and agencies in Washington, DC, we find that it becomes a great challenge to make real impact and movement on, on the issues that are important to Native Americans when we have an administration and when we have policies that restrict us from having a voice and having a, a, a more uh, positive and profound impact on the outcomes. So many of us who are involved in these issues will continue this work. The ethnographic work will commence soon uh, for on behalf of the Pueblo tribes and on behalf of the uh, uh, All Pueblo Council of Governors and the Hopi tribe. And this will be a long um, uh, term initiative. It isn't something that will happen over the course of months or even a year. This will, this will be ongoing and it needs to be understood by the Congress and the federal leadership that continued support of these initiatives is so critical. So please join the Pueblo of Acoma. Please join the All Pueblo Council of Governors and the Hopi tribe in this effort. We have our brothers and sisters on the Navajo Nation who are also involved in this process. And we are, have worked together to develop pending legislation, the Chaco Protection Bill, which we hope will be, become law that will ensure the longer term protection of Chaco Canyon by creating and establishing the 10 mile buffer zone that would be, allow us to protect the resources. Not only the archeological remnants, not only what we see on the surface, but everything else set there by our ancestors so that we might be able to return, to offer prayer, to be there in song and ceremony, and to ensure that the intent of why the places, sacred spaces like Chaco Canyon were established, continue into the future. So I thank you for this opportunity to voice concern, to call for support, and to join us in this important work to protect Chaco and other cultural and sacred landscapes that are vital to the continuance of our indigenous peoples in this nation. Thank you. And now I would like to turn it over to my good friend and colleague and Zuni elder, Mr. Octavius Siatua. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, and uh, thank you, Governor Vial. <clears throat> I've been working with a lot of different people within the Chaco region. A lot of information that is out there is like like what Governor Vial said that it was put out by different archaeologists with the assumption of what they find and with their own information. There's a lot of uh, books, a lot of literature out there that talks about Chaco, but we've never had an opportunity to put in our information. And I think that was part of our uh, fault. We had our elders that were very strict and wanting to keep that, keep that information. And uh, working with the other elders within the ZCAT, uh, the Cultural Preservation 
that they were always stressing this um, this place is ours, this information is ours. Why should we put that information out? But I think with that thought and concept has really put us in this situation for Zuni and some of the other Pueblo communities to not be a part of the voice for Chaco. But we're changing that. We're, we want information out there because we have information coming from all the Pueblo and community about Chaco, why it was there, and like what Governor Vial said, this place was created as a hub of our people getting together and getting and teaching information about the Pueblo and people, the community lifestyle, the sharing of religious activity, the cultural side of, of who the Pueblo and people are, we're all acquired and shared within Chaco. You walk the landscape, you walk on all these different Pueblo Benito, um, Rinconada, all these different places have different ar architectural styles. And this proves that it wasn't just one group of Pueblo people there, it was a combination of all of them. And we were given instructions to come into Chaco to get information about how to proceed with our migration. And getting that information still connects us today with all the Pueblo community. We still have the community sharing the community lifestyle. We have um, practice of ceremonies that originated from Chaco that is still practiced within their community. And that information has never been put out. And I think we need to get more people involved with information, especially the Pueblo people. I know that some of my the uh, people that I work with are still very adamant about not putting information out because they're afraid that this information might be used to benefit the other tribes. But I think little information from all of us would enrich this place called Chaco. This place gives information still to this day of our Pueblo past. It's amazing that with all these information out there, that when we do get a chance to go to Chaco and walk the landscape, we find information that has never been put forth and so with this, um, hopefully with this on, on the ground work that would be done by the Pueblo community, that information that would be put out would uh, be coming from all of us instead of just specifically one tribe. Because I've also been working with Bears Ears and that place is a, a, an amazing place. And that is a combination of a lot of different tribes that were there. But Chacon is a Puebloan past, Puebloan history, Puebloan lifestyle. And any information that would be coming out and benefit Chaco for the protection should come from the source community, which is all the Puebloan people. Because we do have a rich past and a rich future for our future generations to get that information from elders, from people that have been working within the Chaco region. And uh, I was fortunate to start at a young age to be a part of the advisor team. And working with the elders, I acquired, received all that information about Heshota, Pitulia, that's the name of Chaco and Zuni. And we all have our own separate names, but that does not uh, take away the importance of this place with the Pueblo communities. We all have this place to go back, to look into our past, to give information to our future generations about how, how our people survive, to proceed with um, their migration, after emergence to this world. And that information 
is very vital because different places of migration, different places of origin are different within Puebloan communities. But it's amazing that we all have the same concept, the same thought of our people being told and informed of this place called Hesotopituria within Chaco. And uh, like Governor Bio mentioned that there's a lot of information out there, but it wasn't put by the Puebloan people. And I think it's very important that we start with the elders and the uh, the school age children that information and have that as part of our, our curriculum in the schools because when I was growing up, this information was never taught to us. It came from oral history from generation to generation. But that oral history is still very strong within our community. And I think that information should be a part of our Puebloan history, our, our schools, not just the, um, the language itself, but places like Chaco, Mesa Verde, Bearsville, all of these places are a lot of information about our, our past. And getting that information about our past will make us a lot stronger into the future because our, our children would have the, 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 the sound information, that the information that, that we never got growing up. I was fortunate to have two grandfathers that were very influential within Duny, that they were medicine men leaders. And growing up with them, I got this information, received the information from them. And um, it was just like any uh, schooling. They're not really, they weren't really forthcoming with that information. I had to ask for it. And not knowing that I would be a part of the advisory team and re receive that, receiving that information at a very young age from my grandfathers put me in a better situation to understand all these places, Mesa Verde, all the way up to Utah, Bearsville, Chaco, all the way up um, to Pakime, Casas Grande. Our people went down there. There's that uh, Pakime is identical to Chaco. So all, all of these areas that our, our ancestors traveled and left this information for us to look back into our ancestral migration and the past that our people had to go through. And I think this information is very vital to not only the Pueblo people, but people that are now out there within universities getting information about the, the past uh, people that were roaming this region a long time ago. And uh, that information needs to come out from the source community. And I'm fortunate to have been a part of working with Paul and some of the other people that, that are really in the forefront of wanting to preserve this place, not only for the, the native people, but also the people that want to know about our history. Because history is, is what puts, what keeps people together. If you don't have history, then you're a lost person, lost tribe, lost individuals that are looking to find your past. But it's very evident there in Chaco of all of our history because our ancestors left that information behind so that we can be very I guess forceful in, in, in putting our information out because we as Pueblo and people know the history and of Chaco. And so thank you, uh, uh, Representative Fallon and Governor Vial, Paul, uh, for being having me asking me to be a part of this conversation here. It's uh, hopefully we can reach more people 
because I know information going out is it would be beneficial not only to Chaco but also to the other people that are studying through archaeology, ethnology, anthropology, is to get that right information instead of going through the books and learning from what other archaeologists have put out there, but getting that information from the people, from the source communities that are still out there, really being out there trying to protect this place called Chaco. We all have our different names, but uh, it's still important to all of us. And I hope people will listen to this broadcast and uh, be a part of um, saving, saving this, uh, uh, the living legacy of the Puebloan people. Thank you. And uh, I think I'm uh, going to introduce a, a good friend and uh, um, an individual that has really been a big part of my work with, within the Chaco. And, and uh, I want to introduce again Paul. It's uh, been a big help to all of us. Thank you, Octavius. And thank you, Congresswoman Holland, Governor Vio. Um, as an archaeologist, I am happy to say that we are making a transition into a much broader narrative about Chaco, and we're absolutely have been missing the public voices for it. So I hope we can continue um, to have archaeologists like me step out of the way and, and elevate the voices of the people whose ancestors created Chaco. Well, let me go ahead and share my screen. I would just want to run through a couple of slides, um, and then we'll we'll get into our q and I always start out any talk I do on Chaco Canyon by showing the descendant Pueblo tribes around it. So I think too many times in the non-native world, the non-indigenous world, we talk about Chaco as some kind of mysterious civilization. Chaco is an amazing place, um, certainly, but Chaco is the ancestral home of all the Pueblo villages that we see on our map and, and many others that that um, don't appear on the map and went through their own migrations. Um, I wanted to also put up the map briefly um, about the Chaco Protection Bill that um, Congresswoman Holland mentioned. This passed the US uh, House of Representatives last October and got into the Senate and unfortunately stalled. So um, I'm guardedly optimistic that um, perhaps in the new year with some political change, this bill could get reintroduced and make its way through. As all of our speakers have noted, Chaco needs protection and Chaco needs protection from oil and gas. Um, you know, we, we all drive cars, we need oil and gas. We don't need oil and gas near special places. And this is something that I've been thrilled to be part of um, what I consider a struggle against encroaching oil and gas now since 2014. Um, there really is unlimited appetite, I think, in the oil and gas companies for more oil, more gas. And, you know, flares like this disturb Chaco's night skies, um, the impacts on the land, the impacts on the Navajo families living out there, impacts to cultural resources that, as Governor Vio and Octavius both noted, we don't even know what's out on this landscape. Um, the cultural study that the governor mentioned is so important. Um, and that connects into the next issue I want to mention, which is the, the planning process that both BLM and BIA are currently in. You know, we hit a deadline on Friday, a whole bunch of groups, the different individual Pueblos, the Navajo Nation, um, the All Pueblo Council of Governors, a whole bunch of outside environmental and uh, preservation groups submitted comments to try and get the agencies to protect this amazing place in Chaco. So this is a map where I've just tried to give folks a sense of site density around um, different areas of Chaco in the zone, that the areas that we're trying to protect with the bill. Um, and we've tried to get BLM and BIA to protect these areas since we don't, we're not certain that the congressional legislation will make its way through. So these don't show precise site locations, but just to give folks a sense that there are literally thousands of resources. And these are things that archeologists like me find, you know, as Octavius and the governor both noted, Archaeologists are not trained to pick up on the sensitive cultural resources of the descendant Pueblo communities and the ancestral sites. 
So we did a small pilot project with Acoma. We have one planned with Zuni and with the federal funding coming through, we're going to le learn a tremendously lot more. Um, sorry, that was a bad sentence. We're going to learn a lot more about this amazing landscape in the years to come. And we need the agencies to protect it and not allow the oil and gas to encroach on this area before we understand it. So this is just a quick graphic here. Um, as part of a project I did this summer to look at this 10 mile zone and really try to make a case for why we need at least 10 miles of protection. We went and looked at these different areas. Um, and you know, as I mentioned, there are thousands of sites. We came up looking at the site database for the state of New Mexico with about 4,200 sites. Well, these sites cluster into different areas and I'm not showing you the sites because of course we wanna protect these, but one of the most important places is Pierre's. This is on the north edge. Um, of the 10 mile zone of protection. We have um, one of BLM's areas of critical environmental concern, the protected part of this, but you know, with just a boundary thrown up, you can see most of this community is still at risk to oil and gas. A colleague of mine, Ruth Van Dyke, did a study that talked about, you know, how the, the view shed, the view at Pierre's had been impacted, how the well pads, the facilities pretty much make noise constantly and that the special ancestral landscape has really not been protected. Um, there's another, you know, other clusters of sites. This one is down in a different area. We have uh, an ancestral Chaco Road here that's, that's represented by at least 28 of the sites on the ground. And then a large cluster of settlements from um, 5,000 years ago to 1,000 years ago and just a broad range. So what we tried to do in our little study is just convey to the agencies the urgency of setting aside this 10 mile zone. This was in one of the um, alternatives considered by the agencies. It was designated B1. You know, we don't feel like that would totally protect this area by any means, but we encourage them to go ahead and choose that alternative and then think about setting aside additional areas with these different communities. This is another community that is over on the east side of Chaco, um, at least 60 ancestral sites in this. Um, we went out with the Pueblo of Acoma. Um, there are many, many places on this landscape that merit additional protection. Um, and this is something that we are convinced that the agencies need to pay attention to. So that's been a large part of the advocacy that we've been doing. I'm going to stop my sharing here. And um, even with comments having gone in this past Friday, this, this struggle continues, as our other speakers have noted. We need to get the bill through the Senate. We need it to be signed into law. And we need to continue to work with the agencies to protect this, this amazing ancestral place. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Abby for the question and answer session. Thank you very much and thanks to all of our speakers. Thanks, Paul, and thank you to all of our speakers. At this time, we will open up the floor for questions. Um, attendees, please use the Zoom chat feature to raise your hand. If you are dialed in by phone, please press star nine to raise your hand. Um, once you, your hand is raised, please say your name and outlet when you are unmuted and direct your question directly to the speaker you'd like to answer your question. Again, that's the raise your hand icon or star nine if you are dialed in by phone. All right, again, that is star nine or the raise your hand feature um, to ask a question or if you cannot connect to audio, feel free to drop your question in the chat box and we will read it for you. All right, it looks like we have our first question from Heather Richard at ENE News. 
Heather, um, you should be unmuted and feel free to ask your question. Thanks, Abby. Um, yeah, this is Heather Richards. Thank you guys so much for doing this. If somebody could tell me, was the study something commissioned in any kind of way by um, by the representative or by by any of the groups involved, or is this something that's kind of an academic exercise separate? Um, I just want to make sure I'm citing this correctly. Okay, I, I'm just asking a clarifying question. Um, are you speaking of the ethnographic work that uh, Governor Bio and Octavia spoke of? or the study that I spent a little time chatting about? I was talking about your study, thanks Paul. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Um, it was funded through different private parties um, and was designed really specifically to better understand the zone right around Chaco. Um, you know, with, with the, the politics of the Senate bill not proceeding during this past year, we felt like we really needed to understand this zone a little better. Um, so that's why we got out and did that. Um, the project that I'll be undertaking with Octavius and the Zuni team when we can schedule that, will also focus on that zone specifically so that we'll hopefully get new, you know, we have a lot of understanding of the archeology. span We don't, as other speakers have noted, have a great understanding of Pueblo connections to the land. So we're hoping to fill in um, some of that. Heather, do you have anything else you'd like to ask? Oh, am I still unmuted? Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, just to just to be clear on that. So, it was uh, was it something that um, uh, Representative Holland's uh, uh, office reached out to you, Paul, or talked to you in any kind of way to to launch a study? When you say we wanted to know more, I'm just not sure who the we is. If you're you're working kind of independently, um, you know, kind of hand in hand uh, with these different uh, governments, uh, Pueblo governments, or or what? I'm still just a little unclear. No, sure. I'm, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. No, we, we did not speak with the Congresswoman's office before launching the study. As we began to do it, we realized that, you know, it might be of broader interest. Um, we have talked to the Public Governor's Council at various points about different endeavors that we've been doing and have really tried hard as well to support what they're doing. So I hope that clarifies it. Gotcha. Thanks. All right, it looks like our next question is from Dino Grandoni at the Washington Post. Dino, you should be able to unmute yourself and the floor is yours. All right, thank you all for setting this up. My question is for Representative Holland. Um, so other members of the New Mexico delegation, as well as the governor have um, pushed back against this idea from uh, Joe Biden, the Democratic nominee against a uh, full moratorium on oil and gas leasing everywhere in, in the US on federal lands. Um, you have sponsored a bill that would have put a one year pause on oil and gas leasing. Um, but what is your position on a permanent moratorium on oil and gas leasing on federal lands? And um, what have you communicated with the Biden, or the Biden campaign about that? So what I'll say is that um, the Biden campaign or Vice President Biden has um, is supporting our 30 by 30 resolution to save nature. That's to preserve 30% of our land and waters by 2030 uh, with the idea that um, uh, um, climate change, uh, we need to jumpstart um, are, we need to jumpstart a solution to climate change. And so that is one of the things that, um, that he has uh, signed on to. Look, our, our uh, public lands emit 25% of carbon into the atmosphere every single year or day or however you wanna um, say it. Um, I feel that we really need to uh, look at where this drilling is happening. Uh, we don't need drilling everywhere. We don't certainly don't need it near sacred sites, as Paul mentioned. 
And so I, um, I mean, I, th I think in keeping with the, um, the idea that uh, climate change is a critical issue, that uh, we are seeing the effects of it every single day in the, in the wildfires, in the flooding, in the hurricane winds, all of these things that are happening. And um, so I think that it's, it's a, a logical um, thing to look at our, where on our federal lands that we can um, prevent this drilling from happening. We, we, it doesn't need to happen everywhere. And um, with the existing um, policies that Joe Biden has adopted, um, I think we need to look at those and, and see where we can, where we can stop it. Um, just as a follow up, when you say that um, it doesn't need to happen everywhere, is, is that saying that um, you think it is good to permit it to happen, it being oil and gas leasing, in some places? I think that we absolutely need a permanent moratorium on gas and oil drilling in some places in our country, absolutely. And Chaco Canyon is one of those. Okay, Dino, are those all the questions you had? Well, oh, um, I mean, I, I guess I'll just follow up by saying, because I, I, I'm not really sure what the answer is. It, it, are, are, you, are you against, or are you for or against a kind of full moratorium across all federal lands and waters? And I, I appreciate that there are certain areas where it absolutely mm -hmm. cannot happen as you see it, like, a, like near Chaco Canyon, but are there some places in New Mexico or elsewhere on federal lands that, um, oil and gas drilling should be permitted? I, I mean, I don't know. I guess I would have to look at where all of the, you know, where every, where the leases are, where the leases are or where the proposed leases are, or, um, I mean, in New Mexico, we have, you know, this methane cloud floating above the Northwest corner of our state and that's affecting people's lives. People breathe in that pollution every single day. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't see at, at what point do we put the health of our health and well-being of our communities over gas and oil. I think in the, I think we should put the health and well-being of our communities over gas and oil in every instance. So uh, to my knowledge, I haven't seen um, the gas and oil industry uh, made concerted efforts to stop the methane leakage uh, that's happening. Uh, I don't see the methane cloud has gone away. Um, I think you can bring up a map uh, across the country of, of where that is happening. And I mean, we need to make a change in our country and it needs to happen uh, soon. We. And so, um, so sure, if I had my way, it'd be great to stop all gas and oil leasing on federal and public lands because those lands belong to all of us. They don't just belong to one sector of our, you know, of our economy. They belong to everyone. And there are a lot of uh, folks who make a living off of, uh, you know, you know, who make a living off of our environment, um, off of our healthy environment. Folks who, you know, have uh, camping and fishing and these types of tours. There's a green, uh, there's a green economy out there uh, that we need to give, you know, give them a chance to um, to enjoy what a green economy, you know, what a clean uh, environment can bring. So I don't know if that answers your question. No, I, I appreciate that. And um, in terms of uh, your work with the Biden administration, you mentioned the 30 by 30. Um, is, it, is that the main thing that you've worked on um, him with or uh, are there other things? 
So I was on the um, I was on the platform, the 2020 Democratic Platform Drafting Committee, and uh, I'm a, I mostly worked on Native American issues. On the uh, on that, I mean, you know, to do with that, we we uh, we were able to get in that we want to see um, agreements between uh, the tribes and the federal government to manage some of our public lands where it's applicable. We should indigenous voices are important in our environment and on our public lands at these points, as you know, uh, when boundaries were um, were drawn for our uh, for our Pueblo nations, uh, for you know reservations, and for other communities, um, Native Americans weren't at the table. So uh, there's a lot of sacred sites and, and places that we have an obligation to protect that aren't within the exterior boundaries of our communities. So um, part of that is making sure that tribal consultation is followed um, uh, directly the way it's mandated within our federal government and really giving opportunities for tribes to join um, the federal government in mani managing some of these areas. So, um, but otherwise, um, uh, I, I believe that Vice President Biden realizes wholeheartedly the importance of moving on climate change. It's a, it's a, it's a, existential threat to communities all over the globe. And um, so I, I think if you were to take a look at both his environmental plan and also the 2020 Democratic platform, um, that you'll see that he, he is, wants to make big strides in, in moving our country forward. I mean, right now, um, this administration is you know, has gutted the EPA, uh, puts coal and oil lobbyists in charge of, of our federal lands, um, you know, has people who, who have degraded and, um, you know, said the most vile things about Native Americans in charge of the Bureau of Land Management. I mean, I think Vice President Biden is ready to turn those things around and, do what's necessary to fight climate change, to respect our tribal communities. And, and certainly um, I could see uh, Vice President Biden standing up to protect Chaco Canyon. All right, thank you, Dino, and thank you, Representative Holland. I wanna make sure we have time for other questions. So I'm going to move on to a few that we have in the chat box. Um, we have a, a question from Kendra Chamberlain at the New Mexico Political Report, who asks, now that the public comment period has ended on the Gallup Manco's resource management plan amendment, what is the next steps for preventing more oil and gas? Is legislation the last avenue to pursue? And any speaker, you can feel free to answer that. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and respond. <clears throat> so the comment period has ended. Um, we, uh, we know that there was a great response from uh, Pueblo communities and other tribes and others um, who, who share our concern about um, this particular RMPA. Uh, what we are, are very discouraged by is the fact that these deadlines um, have remained in place even while we have made numerous attempts and have voiced even through our congressional delegations the need to pause um, some of these activities as a result of the public health crisis. Uh, we have not had the opportunity to have meaningful consultation with these agencies 
Um, however, the agencies have moved forward with, um, with their deadlines. And um, so what we hope to uh, see as a result of the submittal of additional um, statements to the agencies is that there is and will be an opportunity to have um, additional consultation on these issues, the pending issues, because there are many that are still left unresolved and many that have not been, uh, many issues that have not been afforded the time for meaningful discussion between um, the uh, tribal uh, representatives, experts uh, with the, the federal trustees. So we're hopeful that there will be um, more opportunities to have those discussions. And we'll continue to advocate for that. Thank you. Yeah, I think we might, um, if we see political change with the election, then I think there's a possibility in 2021 of a, another amendment to this long range plan being put forward. Um, you know, they, it's, it's very clear that the cultural work has not been done with the tribes to understand what's going around in greater, what's going on in greater Chaco. And many, many groups have made this point. So um, that's, that's an area that I think our group and others in our partnership would probably push for if we felt like the political climate was right. Um, the other issue is, you know, with the decline in oil and gas, at least in the San Juan Basin, if not so much in the southeast part of the state, we're, we're seeing the issue of, of wells being shut down. And I don't think the federal government has a great plan to rehabilitate this huge oil field that sits all around Chaco and affects many, many living communities. So we're hopeful that that could be part of uh, another amendment to the plan as well. Um, but you know, legislation is not going to happen this year. So it may well be that the current planning process ends with um, without any adequate protection against oil and gas. And that that's a pessimistic view. But I think that a lot of us are looking into the next year and a longer game to see what might happen. I know groups and we're not one of them, but I know groups that are considering lawsuits as well because of some of the things laid out in the work we did, we feel like there might be shortcomings in the approaches to both the NEPA law, the National Environmental Policy Act, and the National Historic Preservation Act. Those could potentially keep a plan from taking place depending upon a legal process, but that's beyond my area of expertise. I just know folks are talking about it. If I could add something as well, um, I mean, look, we, we, the bottom line is we need more renewable energy leases on our public lands. With 25% of carbon coming out of our public lands, it's clear uh, that if we're going to move to a renewable energy economy, that, that uh, those have to be the kinds of leases that we are um, entering into. Uh, it doesn't have to be all gas and oil. Uh, we, we need jobs in New Mexico. We need to transition uh, folks to these clean energy jobs. And the way to do that is to uh, keep pushing on that and moving that forward. It, it doesn't have to be uh, a one size fits all. And in fact, um, you know, if we're talking about the economy and that's, you know, that is a big factor, of course, in, in, in this issue as well as others, but uh, uh, making sure that uh, folks have jobs to go to, uh, sun and wind are never going away in New Mexico. Those are two mainstays there. It's never going to fluctuate. It's, it's not going to be you know, when, when the price of oil declines, uh, the, the, you know, New Mexico's bank account feels it. And um, so we need, we need to diversify our economy and uh, not just uh, think that gas and oil is the only way for us, you know, to move forward because it isn't. We have 350 days of sun per year in New Mexico. And, um, and we all know about the wind. It's, it's there every, every day, practically. So, um, so every chance we get, we should be 
working to transition. We should be working to provide clean energy to these communities so that uh, we don't have to always worry um, about this, this terribly, you know, this pollution and, and all of the things that it causes for um, communities of color mainly. So um, I hope we can get there. Thanks everyone. I want to make sure we have a few more minutes to address the last question that we have. Um, Congresswoman Holland Susan from the Associated Press asks, what has been the reason the Interior Department has given for not releasing the funding? Um, so it looks like um, they had just announced on Friday uh, uh, splitting between Navajo and Pueblo bids. And so um, it looks like the DOI wanted them to do a unified application. Um, I think there are, there's different perspectives, so it looks like that's still um, in discussion. Thank you. And Paul, um, Susan asks, you mentioned work would begin soon. Can you be more specific on the timeline? Um, if this is in regard to the Zinni study of Greater Chaco, we, we, we haven't had the discussion yet. So, and Zinni, as I'm sure folks are aware, has been particularly hard hit by the COVID-19 um, epidemic. So, so I've yet to have those conversations. I imagine that Octavius and I will be able to talk about it within the next week and see. Um, I'm per I would personally love to be able to get out um, before the winter comes in to begin to identify places um, that are of great importance to the Pueblo of Zinni. Um, but we'll, we'll have to see how it goes. That's, that's something that I would like to see happen. Thank you. Um, all right. And before our time concludes for today, Paul, can you clarify for our attendees um, where a public copy of the report will be made available and if your presentation today will also be made available? Sure. Um, yeah, with, you know, one of the things we're very concerned about, of course, is releasing information about locations of sites that um, we don't want people to visit and damage either inadvertently or on purpose. So, so it's something we're going through an internal process to see what we can actually put out um, that folks can access. Um, I think most of my slides are probably going to be okay to share publicly, but I just want to go through a little bit more vetting on that. Um, so I would ask folks to um, stay in touch with me at pread at archaeologysouthwest.org um, and at our site archaeologysouthwest.org as well. We'll have um, some information ultimately that can be shared. But like I said, we just want to be extremely careful about um, the detail of that information going out because um, we have to protect these places. All right, thank you, Paul. Um, unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for today. Again, thank you to all of our speakers for joining the discussion and enjoy the rest of your day.